everyone understands immediately that you give a violin to an untaught person and it will require years of hard work for them to master all the techniques necessary to be able to play the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. I definitely found that having studied music and learnt musical instruments since I was very small, I just expected that I would put in the same amount of practice and hard work into learning to paint as I did into mastering the violin and the piano, um, which are my instruments. Um, and I think that helped me a lot. Welcome to The Bold Brush Show, where we believe that fortune favors the bold brush. My name is Laura Arango Bayer, and I'm your host. For those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a podcast that covers art marketing techniques and all sorts of business tips specifically to help artists learn to better sell their work. We interview artists at all stages of their careers, as well as others who are in careers tied to the art world in order to hear their advice and insights. On today's episode, we sat down with Ruth Fitton, a realist British portrait painter with a love of naturalist melancholic narrative painting. Ruth and I discuss her beginnings as a classical musician turned full-time artist, some key overlaps in terms of discipline between music and art, her greatest influences, and some excellent advice for anyone seeking to improve at the craft of painting. We also talk about the importance of maintaining a clearly defined social media page, which allows the algorithm to better connect your work to the right viewers. She also emphasizes the importance of networking in person whenever possible, as well as on social media. Finally, Ruth tells us about her exciting upcoming solo show at Panter and Hall in London. Welcome, Ruth, to The Full Brush Show. How are you today? Thank you very much. It's good to be here. I'm doing great. Lovely, lovely. And uh, yes, we do have a bit of a time difference, which uh, I love that about the podcast, being able to talk to you know artists from all over who have absolutely amazing work, like yours. Uh, so I'm excited to have you on because honestly, I feel like you're one of the people I've seen who paints absolutely breathtakingly beautiful and you didn't study at an academic school, which is so fascinating to me because it's like, man, I want to do what she did. I could have saved myself like the six years of going to these schools. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's not, uh, it's, it's not without the, the pros and cons are definitely there. Um, so I think I, I missed out on having regular model sessions for years. I would have I would have given anything to to have regular access to a live model. Um, and also, I don't have the I didn't kind of grow up with the sense of community, mm. and uh, I ended up being very much on my own for a while. Now I'm making some more community connections, which is really nice. But it's definitely. Um, yeah, not without the, the pros and also the cons. Yeah, that's understandable. And I, I mean, I did see that you do, uh, I think you do like group sessions at your studio, which I think is really awesome. That's, you know, how you're building community, which is great. Um, but yeah, before we dive into all of that, uh, do you mind telling us a bit about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Well, uh, I'm, I consider myself to be a portrait painter. I've been painting for uh, 11 years. Um, I also do a lot of narrative work and I'm doing sort of more and more narrative work for galleries. Um, yeah, I just, I love painting people and I love uh, creating atmospheres. I go for a kind of naturalistic aesthetic, um, but without unnecessary detail is one of the things I work for a lot. So I guess in a nutshell, that's, that's me. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? I really love that you mentioned that naturalism because your work definitely does have that sort of overcast kind of look to it where it's an overcast day um, and it's very Lepage. You know, it's very much that time period of painting, which I love Lepage. He is so wonderful. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I'm peeking behind you and you have that little circular clock thing that you used in one of your paintings. Um <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah, I love that painting. I forget what it's called, but it's that old woman or old person holding the clock as if they were like mm -hmm. the god of time. Which I, oh, I love that painting. Thank you. It's it's the abduction of time is the title. And uh, yes, I often get asked whether I invented the clock from imagination. They say no, it was actually it was just the clock on the studio wall. <laughs> so it's a working clock. 
It's a working clock, yes. That's so yeah. cool. Oh my gosh. I thought it was just like the front piece of like an old clock or something that got, you know, put in like an antique store or something, but it's really beautiful. Thank Amazon. <laughs> it's uh, very inexpensive. <laughs> it, yeah, in your painting, it looks like it's like some antique piece. So I think you did great making it have that feeling. Um, yeah, wow, that's awesome. So, you know, I wanted to ask you because you actually studied music, which I find fascinating as well. And and like with painting and art, uh, music is actually a very solitary thing as well. So I wanted to ask you how... Have you found any similarities between your studies in music and in painting? Yes, there, um, there are definitely similarities between music and painting. They are generally not the similarities that people expect. I get a lot of people say to me, oh, well, you know, you've done both music and art. Clearly, you're super creative. Um, but uh, actually, the, the thing that really helped me um, particularly becoming a self-taught painter was the fact that I had studied music previously in terms of understanding the concept of constant practice and the discipline to do that constant practice and I think there is um, it's interesting if you uh, if you speak to someone who is involved with the art world or like an amateur artist or someone who knows an amateur artist they seem to think quite often that all you really need is talent and a little bit of practice and you're good to go. If, you, if you've got it, you've got it, right? Whereas no one would ever give a violin to either a child or an adult who had never learnt to play it and expect them to be able to produce the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. Everyone understands immediately that you give a violin to an untaught person and it will require years of hard work for them to master all the techniques necessary to be able to play the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. And um, I think that's a really interesting contrast. But um, yes, I, uh, I definitely found that having studied music and learnt musical instruments since I was very small, I just expected that I would put in the same amount of practice and hard work into learning to paint as I did into mastering the violin and the piano, um, which are my instruments. Um, and I think that helped me a lot. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you in that, you know, people seem to have this erroneous notion of, you know, oh, anyone can paint. You just grab, you know, paint mm -hmm. and you put it on a canvas. Uh, it's like, well, not, no, no. I mean, you can maybe pull that off if you're doing something more modern or contemporary or abstract, maybe. Because even those practices still have their own rules and their own ways of doing things. But I totally agree. It's, it's so funny yes. how, you know, with music, it is absolutely a discipline. It's something that takes forever. And, you know, not, it's, it's like how some people, maybe they have like perfect pitch, which it can happen but in the end everyone has to train it and I'm also of the belief that talent is it's like it's mythical it's like maybe one in like a billion people could say that they're absolutely talented uh whereas mostly it is discipline it is sitting down and doing the work and doing the training and doing all of the basically the uh do re mi of painting which you have to learn it yes right? absolutely yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that actually uh, leads me to a very interesting question, which is, why did you go from music into painting? Like, when was that moment when you were like, I want to paint? I'm going to put down the violin for a second to paint. <laughs> well, um, it's, it's not as exciting as, as it might be. Um, I, uh, I'd always been a, you know, a creative child. I did all sorts of hobby things, I picked up one crafty thing and tried it and then the next two weeks later I was inspired by something else and I tried something else. So I started drawing faces when I was about 15 and I considered taking art for, in, in the UK we have GCSEs which are the exams you take when you're 16. Um, 
but I decided not to take art and I took music instead. I thought I'll do one creative subject and I'll do all the rest, you know, proper subjects. <laughs> um, and that at the same um, with the, uh, the exams you take when you're 18, you know, I continued with music and then I opted to study music at university. Um, but all the way through, I was actually spending probably more time than I should have been um, drawing and um, painting in acrylics. Um, and then my first term at uni, uh, we performed all the first years in the first term, did one big project. That's how it works every year at the uni I went to. And this particular year, we all got together and we performed a Bernstein musical um, called Wonderful Town. And one of the characters in that musical is an artist painting a portrait of one of the other characters. So the director who was in third year said to all of us firsties, is there anyone here who can create us something that looks like a portrait of this girl um, so that we can use it as a prop for the show? So uh, I said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll have a go. And um, it was the first life-size thing I'd done. And it was one of the first things I'd done in paint rather than in pencil. And uh, it was fairly horrendous. I actually, I had a message a couple of months ago from the girl who is in this portrait and she sent me a picture of it. She still got it, bless oh. her heart. She's still got this thing I painted uh, 13 years ago. And it looks like a Disney princess. It's very exaggerated and uh, yes, not particularly <laughs> subtle. Um, but I, I did that. And then the next year, the Opera Society was performing an opera, which involved in the crazy world of opera plots, a painting, a portrait of one of the characters falling off the wall and hitting one of the other characters on the head, um, which, precluded this whole kind of dream sequence and it was all very theatrical. Um, so they knew I'd done the painting the previous year and they asked me again, would you paint us a portrait of this person to use as a prop for our opera? I mean, what are the chances of that happening? Um, so I painted that one as well. And then after the show, the lead tenor's mother approached me and said, I want you to paint a portrait of my son. I will pay you. So that was my first portrait commission. Um, and then by the time I got to most of the way through my degree, I'd done various small commissions for friends and their parents. And it seemed unlikely that I would get my musical career wish of becoming a film school composer. So I chose the less like, less, uh, less difficult option. <laughs> Um, of becoming a portrait painter, as you do. Um, so I made that decision sort of part way through my final year at uni and my parents bought my first ever oil paints as a gift for my 21st birthday. So I mark my painting anniversary is also my birthday. Um, so, yes, that, so was, that was how it happened. Yeah, wow. I think that was more exciting than you think. <laughs> Because it almost feels like, you know, you fell into the path of least resistance for you. And it just like things just lined up, which doesn't always happen to people. You know, it's it's like mm -hmm. um, it's it's such a balance of, you know, you hear the call, right? The call to like become a painter and you kept on with it, you know, despite, you know, doing your music. But it's wonderful that you still kept on that path anyway. Like, yeah, I'll just keep doing it because I love it. Um, you know, like. Yeah, some people, they tell themselves or they hear from others like, oh, don't do that. That's such a waste. Artists don't make money, which, of course, is a lie. Um, mm -hmm. So it's great that you, you know, went on with it anyway. Um, and then I wanted to ask you, who would you say are your greatest influences when it comes to your artwork? Well, you've already mentioned one of them. You mentioned Lepage, mm -hmm. um, Lepage and the other naturalists. Mostly I just, I find myself really drawn to that cloudy day outdoor lighting. I think it's probably partly because I grew up in Yorkshire in the north of England, where we have quite a lot of cloud. Um, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I also love a couple of British painters who worked at a kind of similar time, um, Stanhope Forbes, 
is one of my favourites and a lesser known artist called Frank Bramley. Um, both of them working with a lot of outdoor scenes, a lot of overcast skies um, and a very unfussy paint application, which I, I enjoy. I'm not a fan of really flamboyant, um, over dramatic paint work. Yeah, and definitely Overcast does have that subtle softness, um, you know, that you, you, and it's actually quite colorful. A lot of people would think that it's very pale, but it's not. It can be actually mm -hmm. quite colorful to be able to see all the little subtle tones that sometimes direct light can wash out completely, uh, especially in photography Absolutely, as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, so speaking of, because I think, you know, especially you mentioning the violin. I find that the violin, in my opinion, is a very melancholic instrument. Um, and I also find that your work does have a bit of a melancholic air to it. Uh, what are some of the topics that inspire you to paint? Well, um, on a personal level, I think I connect a lot with themes of courage and resilience. So I guess the, the kind of melancholic air comes from me placing characters perhaps in situations of um, adversity on some level. I like the idea of um, uh, staying strong in, in adversity. And I think that comes through quite a lot in what I'm painting. Uh, the, the main thing that I'm going for really is um, obviously, I'm, I'm aware that I'm painting in quite a classical fashion with quite, um, yeah, it, it harks back to olden time paintings in various ways. But uh, the one thing that I'm really trying to bring is I want to, my female characters to actually be characters. And I say this quite a lot. It honestly amazes me that there are still in this day and age, there are a lot of painters, wonderful, wonderful contemporary painters of both male and female who will still paint pictures of beautiful landscapes with beautiful women just standing there in side profile, looking slightly down or looking slightly up or even from the back of the head. And they have no motivations of their own. They have no discernible story apart from the fact that they're standing there looking beautiful, being a compositional focus in a beautiful work of art. And I could not paint something like that. It just, um, it doesn't sit right with me. And so I spend a lot of time thinking and planning and thinking whenever I start a painting, it has to have a story. Even if the story itself is not massively obvious by the time the painting is completed, as long as I know there has been a narrative and that the character I'm portraying has in my intention, um, motivations and emotions, um, then I'm happy and I actually get Every now and then I will get a message from another artist, usually a female, saying, I really, really love the way you make your women into people. And um, I mean, that's not the only reason I paint and it's not my only focus, but it's. Uh, yeah, I guess it's one of the things I choose to do with what I'm doing. Yeah. Apple brush, we inspire artists to inspire the world because creating art creates magic, and the world is currently in desperate need of magic. Boldbrush provides artists with free art marketing, creativity, and business ideas and information. This show is an example. We also offer written resources, articles, and a free monthly art contest open to all visual artists. We believe that fortune favors the bold brush. And if you believe that too, sign up completely free at boldbrushshow.com. That's B-O-L-D-B-R-U-S-H show.com. The Bold Brush Show is sponsored by Basso. Now more than ever, it's crucial to have a website when you're an artist, especially if you want to be a professional in your career. 
Thankfully, with our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast, you can make that come true and also get over 50% off your first year on your artist website. Yes, that's basically the price of 12 lattes in one year, which I think is a really great deal considering that you get sleek and beautiful website templates that are also mobile friendly, e-commerce, print on demand in certain countries, as well as access to our marketing center that has our brand new art marketing calendar. And the art marketing calendar is something that you won't get with our competitor. The art marketing calendar gives you day-by-day, step-by-step guides on what you should be doing today, right now, in order to get your artwork out there and seen by the right eyes so that you can make more sales this year. So if you want to change your life and actually meet your sales goal this year, then start now by going to our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast. That's F-A-S-O dot com forward slash podcast. I love that because I completely agree with you. I feel like historically, actually, even paintings from the Renaissance have character, you know, women with more character than some of the prettier uh, sort of uh, objectified uh, presence of a woman in a painting today. You know, like, I completely agree that it it is boring for me. It's so funny because I'll have this discussion with guy friends where they'll see a painting of this beautiful woman and she's like sleeping or she's like laying down. I'm like, this is so boring. I mean, she's not adding anything interesting into my psyche. And I don't, I don't see what she's going through. I don't, I can't relate to it because no. And oftentimes that does happen with, unfortunately with male painters. Uh, and I totally get it. I mean, they don't know what it's like to be a woman, but yeah, it is a bit boring and a bit overplayed to have a pretty young woman who's, you know, the mm-hmm. reclined nude or something, you know, like <laughs> it's been done a thousand times over and it's fine. But I do agree that adding a little bit more of narrative, a little bit more story, uh, a little bit more of the, I guess, the more fascinating archetypes of being a woman, you know, kind of like how Kathy Colwitz, you know, with her, the mother sort of archetype that she paints again and again and draws again Mm -hmm. and again I love that I think that is you know it takes things to a much further level than just decorative female uh but you know there are people for everything I'm not hating on decorative female paintings I'm just saying they're not my preference either because there's more there's a lot more to life than just here I am um so I totally agree with you um I wanted to ask you now what is like the number one tip? Because you're primarily self-taught, right? You sat down and you painted, yeah. you did not attend academic school, um, which takes a lot of discipline to reach the level that you've reached, which is insane. I, I completely, like you inspire me. Um, so I wanted to ask on behalf <laughs> <Thank> of, you. <laughs> you're welcome, on behalf of painters who maybe are in a similar position as you, where maybe they can't go to an academic school or maybe they don't have access to that. Um, what is the number one tip for them to improve at their craft? My number one tip for improving artists um, is practice with intention. I think there's, um, it's very easy to fall into the habit of just doing the same thing over and over and thinking, oh, uh, you know, I just have to keep going. Um, and consequently making the same mistakes over and over without really thinking about it until they're absolutely ingrained. Um, That would be one tip. But my other tip is don't be too hard on yourself because conversely, I have seen, and I know many great painters, um, sort of my peers, my similar age to myself, who are doing great work and I see them tearing themselves down because their standards are so high and the place they want to get to is so high and lofty. And I don't think that is, um, that's not a good headspace to be in. It's not going to be productive for you actually improving. Um, It's just going to make you miserable and make your friends miserable. so yeah that is that is actually my my more genuine tip is um obviously practice obviously strive to get better obviously do lots of research but also be happy with where you are and be happy with what you are producing and don't always ignore how 
good you're getting because you're too obsessed with how good you want to be. Words of wisdom. Oh my gosh. That is so true. It is so easy. <laughs> yeah, it's so easy to fall into that trap of, you know, my goal is over there and you forget that, you know, where you're standing is already quite a feat, right? It's uh, it's so great to look back mm-hmm. at maybe like your first painting or, or you, you know, the first times that you attempted something and then comparing that to, yeah, oh my absolutely. gosh, I've learned so mm-hmm. much. Yeah, which actually what you mentioned reminded me so much of music because, you know, the, the practicing with intention, right? I find that when I watch musicians practice, they have this tendency of if they reach a very complex part of a piece, they'll repeat it maybe a little slower and then they'll go through it mm-hmm. again and again until they can move past that problem, uh, which I mean, it should be the same with painting, right? We also, like, there are so many similarities in that sense where we have the scales and we have those those hard moments where you have to slow down. And I think a lot of people are so, you know, the instant gratification of, I got to finish this fast and I got to move through this. And and yes. there's, I, I'm running out of time, um, which, I mean, I get that. Life is short, but it's okay to slow down and really sit through those issues and and that yeah just digest them a bit longer to get past them then rather than just okay I did it it's yeah I'm satisfied it's like are you are you satisfied (laughs) yes yeah um so now I'm kind of curious about the marketing side and the social media side um do you have any social media tips for an artist who is looking to get their work seen more like by potential buyers or students or collectors or maybe galleries? Well, um, social media for me is Instagram, basically. I don't do Facebook. Um, So I have a couple of uh, tips, which I guess maybe people know or don't know um, that I have picked up from discussions with other friends who are also trying to use Instagram effectively and the main tip is that it helps if you have a niche not just with your art but with what you are presenting on Instagram so if you are a portrait painter don't suddenly start interspersing your portrait images with the landscapes Um, the Instagram algorithm is not going to like that Um, and it does have a tendency to penalize you beyond a, one individual post if it doesn't like what you've done. Um, so I have friends who will have a page for their portrait work, a page for their teaching work, and a page for their nude figures in particular. Do not mix your nude figures in with the rest of your page because Instagram really, really doesn't like them. And you don't want the entirety of your output penalized and hidden from everybody because you've got some nude figures in there so put your nude figures all in one page and then if Instagram wants to hide that page it's only hidden a percentage of your work rather than all of it. That's so smart I didn't think about that (laughs) because it does tend to happen especially with academic painters so uh Instagram you know Mm -hmm. shadow bans them for I don't know how long just because they posted a realist painting of a nude uh, which is, you know, mm-hmm. not a real nude. It's a painting. It's artistic. But, it, you know, they're like, nope, big nope. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's good to have that because then, you know, like you said, maybe you have a crowd who can also follow, you know, just your portraits or just your landscapes um, or just your teaching mm-hmm. page, which it really helps compartmentalize, like you said, and really, yeah, bring more of a focus to the algorithm to, you know, expedite your work mm-hmm. out to the right people. Uh, which is great yeah um yeah and also if if your Instagram is one of your main landing pages for anyone who you know rather than going to your website often these days people will just go straight to Instagram mm -hmm. and so it helps to properly curate your page so a similar thing it's good to have things unified um I find my page gets the most response when I have mostly all kind of close-ups of faces Mm -hmm. so it looks like it's like a shop window or a store window as you would stay in the states um uh, if everything if everything in a in a display matches it's like eye candy like if um 
I was recently at the Portrait Society of America show and in the materials hall, you've got Michael Harding with this array of paints, you know, all these boxes in all different colors, but they're all arrayed in the same way. And there's rosemary brushes with all their different brushes. Um, and if you took everyone's stalls and jumbled them all up, it would just be a mess. But as it is, you go from one to the next and it's just this eye candy of all their similar things displayed together. So yeah, um, you have to do the same with your Instagram page. It's your store window. You have to make it so that it all matches and harmonizes and is exciting and delicious to look at. I like that description, delicious to look at. It feels like a pastry shop. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, your Instagram should be your pastry shop. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, you know, yeah, and, and it's also good to have, obviously, to still have a website anyway, because, you know, that way the people who are very interested, oh, yeah. can just, then they can just pop in and then they'll see the rest of your work and then they'll sign up for your newsletter and then they have more of an opportunity of, I guess, getting more of an intimate sort of look into what you do, who you are, yeah. maybe if you have a blog, which is really nice. Absolutely. And I find that the the people who are more serious will go from my Instagram to my website. So if I get an inquiry through my website, I will take it much more seriously than all the DMs I get on Instagram, most of which are spam. So yeah, yeah it's definitely, it's like Instagram is the front of the shop and the website is the actual shop where all the good stuff yes. happens. Yes, exactly. No people asking for NFTs on your website. <laughs> it's just on Instagram. No. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so this is one question that I, I like to ask uh, basically everyone that I interview, which is, you know, the side of how, like, do you, have you had to keep a day job while you paint or have you been able to live off your paintings? It's a very short answer. I've never had a job other than painting. Nice. Um, yeah. That's great. That's cool. I had a couple of, well, I've had several very slim years, but um, yes, I've never, never taken on a different job. That's awesome. Yeah. So that makes it a lot easier too for you to balance your time with painting and, and spend time, you know, doing what you love, which is very fortunate. I know a lot of people who they worked their day job for years and years until, you know, their work took off, which is why I like to ask, you know, there are so many different ways that artists have been able to move past things and have been able to you know make their money with their work um so it's good to have a bit of a I guess an understanding from different artists about their own paths because for some people it might be one way for others it might be like your path um that's awesome mm -hmm. yeah uh and then so I wanted to ask you because you are part of a lot of different societies, right? You're part of the Oil Painters of America. I think you're also part of the Royal Portrait. Uh, what is it? Yeah, Royal Oil Royal Institute of Oil Painters. I think it is. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm okay. So I am. I'm actually only a member of the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, okay. and I have signature status membership with the Portrait Society of America. Um, I don't think I've ever, I've never exhibited with Oil Painters of America, actually. Um, okay. But I should look into it. Um, ah, yeah. And yes, I have exhibited with the Royal Portrait Society here in the UK as well, but I'm not a member with them. Ah, gotcha. That's awesome, though, um, because I find that, you know, what I wanted to ask you is, um, do you think that those are really, really awesome ways to network and to meet others? And would you recommend for artists to join societies like those? I absolutely would. Um, yeah, so the um, the societies I am like have membership with that I mentioned, that's not something you pay for, that's something that you get elected into. Um, so you can't just decide I'm gonna sign up for membership. Yeah. Uh, however, um, whether it's a society like Portrait Society that has a paid membership section or whether it's just applying to exhibit with a society like the ROI, the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, or the RP, the Royal Society of Portrait Painters. Um, if you get into the show, obviously you go to the private view and that's where you meet all the other artists who are exhibiting. So I think that's um, 
certainly if you're based in the UK, I think those uh, those shows are really good to enter for. Or even if you're not in the UK and are able to make the trip to London, if you get selected for the exhibition, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a fantastic experience. You know, all the artists are there. Their work is on the wall. You can literally you know walk up to a person's painting and talk with them about their work with an example of it right there. Um, and you can go along even if you're if you get someone to take you as their plus one. Um, <laughs> you can go along even if you're not an exhibitor and. Uh, yeah, they tend to be at really fun events. Nice. Yeah, it seems like it. Um, it seems like it's, you know, <clears throat> a great way to meet maybe uh, other artists who are uh, maybe close to you or close by to you and then learn from them. Or even I have heard others who have said that that's how they've met their galleries as well and how they've connected in that way. Um, are there other ways that you would suggest for artists to network? I would suggest, uh, I think one of the best ways to network is actually to take workshops. So um, sign up for a workshop with your favorite artist, and you not only get to meet your favorite artist, but you get to meet half a dozen, a dozen people who are also learning to paint, who also love that artist. I mean, it's a fantastic, it's a ready-made um, networking opportunity, really. Um, as well as things like the Portrait Society of America conference, or I mean, I've never been to the other conferences in the States, but um, I would really like to sometime, um, the plein air convention, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I just think if you can actually get people together in person, that is the best way to network, definitely. Yes, yes. And actually, I think also social media for those who can't really travel very much, because um, it does seem like, you know, social media at least connects you with, you know, people who might also go to those conventions and might also go to those, you know, places. Yes. Where people go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, I wanted you to mention more about your teaching, because I feel like you do you take online mentorships, like do you teach others online? I don't. Um, I get asked all the time whether I teach online. Um, at the moment, I have not had the time to sort it out. I mean, I'm, I follow a couple of people, I, you know, people's Patreons and that kind of thing. Or I'm not currently, but I have done previously. Um, and the time and effort that goes into actually producing a quality product Combined with the fact that I don't currently have Wi-Fi in my studio, um, that's not ideal. So <laughs> I'm not offering online teaching at the moment. Um, I'm okay. taking, I'm teaching a couple of workshops this year, uh, in-person ones. Um, I'm teaching one with Artiscape Italy next week, and I'm teaching one in Seville with La Galleria Roja in October. That's so exciting. Oh, that's awesome. I totally Yes, understand. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I totally understand not having time. I'm sure you probably have commissions to take care of and your own personal work that you want to take care of. And then also, you know, going to these workshops that you're teaching and preparing for those. It is quite a lot on your plate. Um, I guess one final question for you, because now that you mentioned, you know, being a bit busy, um, how have you found yourself to be able to time manage a little bit? Oh, um, <laughs> that, that's a, that kind of assumes that I am successfully time managing at the moment. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure that I am. Um, I I try and paint uh, nine to five, five days a week. Um, sometimes I do six days a week because I go to uh, other. I go to a portrait group that's hosted by a friend here in London. I'm actually no longer hosting my own group since okay. I moved from my lead studio to London because there are groups here already. So I'm taking a break from hosting and I'm doing the drop in thing, which is great. Um, so uh, timing, yes, uh, this means that basically I do admin in the evenings and at the weekends. So mm -hmm. I'm working pretty much around the clock I work and I keep house for myself and that's pretty much the extent of my life at the moment wow 
Yeah, but you still sound busy. I mean, nine to five, that's a lot of time painting. That's a full-time job, which is... Uh, oh, yeah, I, I would kill yeah. to have that time. <laughs> 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 but yeah, um, so actually, uh, I wanted to ask you about your upcoming solo show. Yes, well, thank you. Um, I have an upcoming solo show. Uh, I have a show in London in July. Uh, with a gallery called Panther and Hall, who have been running for 25 years or more. And they're a wonderful gallery, wonderful people. They have a gallery on Pall Mall, which is right in the centre of London. It's kind of, if you go along Pall Mall, you reach the National Gallery. So it's, it's a wonderful, um, wonderful spot. And there are 19 paintings in the show. Most of them are figure and landscape works with I think six small plein air landscapes as well so 13 figurative and six landscapes so it's uh yeah it was kind of put together in a quite intense period of time probably about seven or eight months um having done all the planning prior to that so it was just literally brushed to canvas and um it was very exciting, actually. I found myself doing a lot of work that I was really happy with and, um, yeah, reach, reaching new heights, if I may say so, um, which, <laughs> yes, I, I permit myself to say that I'm reaching new heights. I am allowed to say that. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased with the, the work that's going up there. And it's all, uh, as we were talking about, it's all very narrative and... Um, it's all kind of loosely based around the theme of journeying with thinking that this both allows me to place the figures in landscapes, which I love, and also uh, a physical journey can be a metaphor for a mental journey. So, um, yeah, obviously that uh, means the paintings have a, you know, a wider um, relevance than just being literal stories of people wandering in fields, for example. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. I wish I could go. <laughs> yes. Well, I will do an Instagram live on the day we open. Oh my gosh. And, uh, yeah, show that. everyone around. Yeah. Yes. I'll put a reminder for that because I really want to see that. Um, I'm also a big fan of your work, so it's uh <laughs> it would be so nice to go and be like oh, Thank you. go. oh my god you're welcome um but yeah is there anywhere else that you have your work that people can go check it out um i have a couple of pieces in the salma gundy club um for the hartley invitational exhibition which i think is up until the 31st of this month mm -hmm. so anyone in the new york area can go and see a couple of small works there, along with a lot of other very sensational works. I was very intimidated when they published the list of exhibiting artists after I had already, you know, painted and framed up. And then obviously I had a complete meltdown when I saw who all was going to be involved in this exhibition. <laughs> um, yes, obviously I did my best work anyway. Um, but uh, yes, I, th I think there's always if I knew that I was going to be exhibiting amidst the company that I was, I think I would have found it within myself to magic up an extra gear to go into. Or maybe not. Maybe I would have just made myself really stressed. I don't know. Maybe it's just as well. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then your social media and website? Yeah, uh, my social media Instagram is Ruth Fitton Portraits, and my website is just ruthfitton.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ruth, for giving us some of your time, your precious time, uh, considering you're probably busy trying to prepare for your solo you're show. You're very welcome. Uh, of course. And thank you for your tips. Um, I am definitely inspired to be a lot more disciplined with painting. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you. It's been fun. I've enjoyed it. Yes, I'm glad. <laughs>